Hey, this morning, I want to talk about safety nets. Is that all right? Safety nets. Is that okay? Sure, sure why not, huh? <laughs> Since I'm going to do it anyway, right? Yeah. Okay, we'll just go with him. So, because what is a safety net? Usually, they're employed when there's danger of injury, right? If you've ever gone to the circus and you've seen the high wire artist walking a tightrope, or the trapeze artist swinging from bar to bar, you've probably noticed the net that is spread out below them, right? And what is that? We all know that that's the safety net, isn't it? And what's its purpose? It's designed to catch them if they make a mistake and fall so that they don't injure themselves or even worse, lose their life. So here's the thing. As a church, what's our motto? It's in our bulletin, right at the top of that line. We want to be what? A safety net for hurting and broken people. So I want us to look at that this morning for just a few moments, okay? What does this really mean? What would God ask of us based on his word? I mean, is this a biblical concept? Do we find guidance in his word for this? And, and if so, what are we doing as a church to be this safety net, both individually in our own lives and then as a body? How does this look, okay? So if you'd like to follow along with me in scripture this morning, will you find Romans chapter 6? We're going to read verses 15 through 23. And then I'm going to lay out just some of what our vision is this morning as a church. And don't worry, even though I've had two cups of coffee this morning, and I'm so excited about these announcements I've been able to share, I will try, I will keep to my notes this morning and not get off on too many rabbit trails, okay? Because I know parents, grandparents were, you're, you're probably hoping for a little bit of a shorter service this morning, so I'll try to keep that in mind. But this passage in Romans lays out pretty clear why we all need a safety net. And why is this? Because we have all been broken by sin, okay? And we're suffering the consequences of that sin, whether it's sin in our own lives, past or present, and the consequences those sins bring, or the sins other people commit, okay? I'm sure we all realize we can be deeply affected by other people's sins, right? We can be deeply affected. Maybe we are not even wrong in a certain scenario, but somebody else is wrong or they wrong us, and that affects us. See, we don't live in a world where we are isolated from each other, no matter how much they try to do these lockdowns, right? We don't live in a world isolated from each other. So the effects of our sins spread among us just as a sickness can spread from one person to another. And what are the effects of our sin? Brokenness, right? Hurt, all kinds of things. And so here's the reason for all of our brokenness as Paul writes in Romans chapter 6, starting in verse 15. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to, and here we have it, the first reason for our brokenness, which leads to death. That's a little bit of brokenness, isn't it? Yeah. Or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. Now, I put this in human terms because you are weak in your natural selves. Just as you used to offer the parts of your body in slavery to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer them in slavery to righteousness leading to holiness. And let me make a point about holiness real quick, okay? What is holiness? Okay? Here is the concept behind holiness. It's wholeness in our lives that God restores to us that is separate from this world, we find our wholeness in him, okay? Wholeness in him. We are no longer trying to find what we're looking for in this world, which leads to what? Brokenness and bondage and despair. Instead, we have been redeemed out of that. We are set apart for God, 
and we're looking to him for what we need. And so as we look to him, separate from this world, right, coming out of the things of this world, the mindset, what's important to this world, we're finding what we need in God. And what does he restore to us? Wholeness. Just as he designed us to be back in the Garden of Eden, okay? Holiness in him, and we are set apart from this world then for him, okay? So we offer ourselves then in slavery to righteousness that leads to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Okay, and there's another aspect of sin, right? That's brokenness right there. Shame, condemnation, guilt, all of that. Those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray, shall we? Father, I thank you for your word. God, that it is truth that we can trust every word. God, you guide us in your paths that paths of righteousness that lead us closer to you. And as we are drawing closer to you, you want to breathe life into us and restore us. You want us to re want to restore us back to that place that we were originally created for, to walk with you in the garden and be made whole in you. But God, we've got to be separate from this world. And so, God, I just pray that you'd speak into our lives this morning. God, give us a vision for our lives. God, would you awaken and birth new dreams within us and give us a vision as a church for what you have for us to do in this valley. And, God, we give you the praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Well, <clears throat> I'm excited about getting into God's word. I don't know if you guys are kind of sitting there going to kind of, um, kind of trying to comprehend everything going on this morning. Um, I don't know if I allowed enough time for everything to sink in, I am just really excited to be able to bring Pastor Lynn on board as our associate pastors. Yes. Uh, they have been good friends of ours for a long time, and they love what God is doing here. They've gotten to love you guys as a body, and I think they're just going to be a great addition. Amen. And so we're going to look forward to some great days ahead. And so this morning, I want to lay out some of the picture, and then you guys can see... If you've ever wondered, okay, what is Pastor Randy thinking and where are we going as a church? I'm going to open my heart to you this morning and show you that. Are you guys ready for that? It, don't worry, it's a safe place to go, okay? <laughs> at least I hope, okay? So anyway, we'll get started here at the beginning based upon our passage of Scripture. And then we're going to get into how we are responding to this, okay? Sin entered this world because of our rebellion. I think we can all agree on this, right? Yes. Yeah. We basically broke what God had created beautiful and perfect. Mm -hmm. And with our rebellion, Satan has been able to put his mark on what we broke, okay? On our own individual lives, okay? On our families and our relationships in this world, on our governments. Does... <laughs> Do I need to say, does our government bear the mark of Satan on it? Yeah. Oh, yeah, very much. A lot of wickedness going on there. As men in our brokenness grab for power, and what does power do? It corrupts, doesn't it, okay? Satan has been able to place his mark even on nature itself. We look out at what we see, and I love the mountains. Yeah. I love being able to live here so close to Glacier National Park. It's yeah. one I've traveled most of the United States, and this is probably one of the most beautiful places in all of America. Okay? I feel blessed to be able to live here. But do you realize that what we are looking at, as beautiful as it is, is horribly marred by sin? It's horribly destroyed, damaged and destroyed because of the mark of sin that is placed upon it because of our rebellion, okay? It's called this, the law of sin and death, okay, of death and decay. You can call it extinction and decay and, and all that sort of stuff. In fact, um, in the same letter to Romans, Paul wrote this, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time, okay? So this mark or this, <clears throat> excuse me, this activity of Satan has wreaked destruction and death 
and brokenness in every area of our world, in our lives, and in society. And while we as believers in Jesus Christ, okay, have been set free from the bondage of this world, amen? We have been set free from that bondage because of the power and the authority of Jesus Christ. We are still living here, being affected by this world and waiting for our full redemption. So let's con continue on in Romans there. Paul wrote this. And we believers also groan. I'm picking up in chapter 8 what I just read about creation, okay? And we believers also groan even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a what? He is a foretaste of our future glory, okay? For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us, okay? This means that while we wait for this future glory, we can be, what is the state of affairs right now? We can be and we are affected by the sin and the brokenness in this world. Do you ever feel that way in your own life? <laughs> you go to work and you're having a wonderful day and somebody just upsets you. They, they get in your face or w for whatever reason. Or you just wake up on the wrong side of bed. Oh, I gotta, And you're just dealing with something, okay? We are affected by this, okay? And really, all of humanity is affected by this law of sin and death. It is one of the laws at, in operation in our world, okay? The lost who are mired in their sin need Jesus, okay? They need to hear the message of the gospel so they can have a chance to turn from their sin and be set free like us. But we who are believers need to grow in our friendship with Jesus Christ, <clears throat> excuse me, so that he can continue with this healing and delivering process that he's ministering to each one of us, okay? His goal, according to our text, is to set us free from sin. Sorry, I lost my place. Oh, okay, I found it. Set us free from sin and all the brokenness it brings to our lives to make us holy in him, okay? which means we find our wholeness in him and not in this world and then give us eternal life. This is God's desire for us, for all of his creation, really. He wants to, he wants to have his creation back, okay? He wants his creation back, all of it including the mountains and the forests and everything. He, and, and Jesus is the foretaste of that. He fought the battle that allows that to happen. He took back authority from the enemy. Yeah. So Satan's mark on this world is limited, okay? Jesus won that victory, and someday when Jesus returns, God gets all of his creation back, including you and me, okay? And he gets to restore everything to its original place including our lives. And the mark of sin, the mark of Satan is erased from our lives. Aren't you? Sorry, I'm getting off. I'm on a, I'm on a rabbit trail. Okay, I'll get back to you here because we've got to keep it shorter this morning. Aren't you excited about that day when you will no longer have the mark of sin of the enemy on your life? You don't have to wrestle with a sinful nature anymore. You don't have to wrestle with your spouse's sinful nature. Oh, hallelujah, won't that be a great day? No, I really don't have to wrestle with too much of one there. She has to wrestle with mine more, okay? Or a friend or a neighbor that just aggravates you or somebody at work. Aren't you glad? We won't have to wrestle with that anymore. And, and we look at this world, we call it, I know in science class they call it the law of, of what is it, Darwin's um, survival of the fittest. Well, what it really is is the law of sin and death, okay, according to Scripture, and that's going to be gone. It's erased. I can't wait. I can't wait to see creation then, Okay. This is God's desire for us. So what does this look like, though, in the meantime, while we're wrestling with sin, we're battling a sinful world, and God wants to bring wholeness to broken and hurting people in our world and redeem them out of our sin. What does this look like for us as a church and the role God has for us to play in this valley? So first of all, what is our biblical mission based upon God's word? Okay, let's look at that first. First of all, our biggest mission, the most important one that we can ever be involved with is this. Get the message of the gospel out to lost and broken people in our world. Amen? 
so they can have a chance to be made right with God and God can begin this process of restoring them to that place, yes. walking by, at his side, okay? Because he is the ultimate answer to the human need. Amen. Where is the brokenness in our lives? It's in our heart. We have a broken heart. And the only one who can heal that broken heart, the loneliness, the despair, whatever it is, is Jesus Christ himself. <clears throat> okay, he is the answer. And that's why we are to get his message out. In Mark, Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. And to emphasize this need, <clears throat> excuse me, Paul wrote this. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? <clears throat> excuse me. And how can they hear without someone preaching right. to them? Okay? Yeah. This is our first and primary goal and this preaching involves all of us. Okay, let me be real clear on that. We, the church of Jesus Christ, are the ones who have been called and anointed by God okay, to preach his good news that all people can be forgiven and set free from their sins through what Jesus Christ did for us on that cross. This is why we preach and we believe very strongly here at Journey Church our enemy is not the neighbor next to us, okay? People are always the treasure. Even the politicians, do I dare say that? Even those in the news media, I know I'm really on thin ice here, I know. Believe it or not, they are the treasure. They have been bound up by the enemy's lies and have believed them. We need to be praying for them, okay? So, and we preach with what we say, in our conversations, and we preach with how we live, our lifestyles, okay? We preach in both ways. Yes. This is mission number one, but following closely on its heels is mission number two, which is this, to make disciples. Yes. Our second mission as a church is to help each other grow and become mature disciples of Jesus Christ. In Matthew, Jesus said, <clears throat> excuse me, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given me. Yes. And as soon as he said that, what's his first words right after that? Therefore, because of this, yes. go and make disciples of all the nations, okay? And what is a disciple? A disciple, simply put, is someone who follows and learns from somebody else. You can be a disciple, and I see it all the time in my Google feed, you can be a disciple of your fa favorite fitness trainer, your favorite influencer, or your favorite teacher or public leader or whatever it might be. And can I say there is nothing wrong with learning from other people like this and wanting to be like them, following them, their example as long as they are godly examples and Jesus is number one, right? Jesus is the one whom we follow the most. Because what does it mean as modern day disciples of Jesus Christ? What does it mean? We are to follow Christ's teachings and his example so that we can learn from him how he wants us to live life in this world, okay? We are right now learning how to be his ambassadors in this world and citizens of his heavenly kingdom, even while we're still living in this world, okay? Even though we have our citizenship in heaven right now, we are left in this world to be his ambassadors. How do we do that? We have to learn that. So we're learning to pattern our lives after his example and teaching. Now, here's a really important part that I want to add to this. Before we get to point number two this morning and we wrap up. Part of this disciple-making process that we have really focused in on here at Journey Church, our niche, so to speak, and what we feel is our specific role to play in this valley that we feel is God's specific calling, <clears throat> involves the work that God is doing in all our lives to make us whole in Him, right? Our motto, we want to be a safety net for hurting and broken yes. people. We want to help in that process of bringing people to wholeness. Mm -hmm. It's what we call, are you ready for this? It's a big theological word. Jeez. It's what we call sanctification. Mm -hmm. And what is sanctification? Big, scary theological word, right? That's hard to understand. Well, hopefully not really. 
It's a wonderful theological word that is simple to understand once we know the basics. And here are the basics. Cleanse, heal, and restore. Does that sound like our motto? To be a safety net for broken and hurting people, okay? And as soon as I do something, all of you have seen me do this before, it's gonna click for you, go, oh, now I know that's what he means. Are you ready? Uh Uh-huh. Those of you who have been here long enough, instantly go there. You know what I'm talking about. This is a picture of sanctification. Is it now all of a sudden it's clicking, right? If you have not seen me do this illustration, let me walk you through it. I'm not going to do it this morning because this is one of Lisa's favorite cups from Montana Coffee Traders. I would lose my life if I broke this thing, okay? Because who is this? Us. This is us. We are a vessel for the Lord set apart for him. This is us. We were meant for fellowship with us and to give him pleasure. Mmm, that's great coffee. Or whatever, okay? Okay, but what does the world world do to us? What does the world... uh, Let me actually give you a longer definition real quick and then I'll go into this illustration. The longer definition of sanctification is this. It's the process God walks us through of cleansing and healing us with his ultimate goal of making us whole in him, okay? Okay. And here's what I've done, okay? And I purposely did not bring a hammer with me in case I accidentally got carried away, okay? Because what have I done with the cup in the past? I've smashed it with what? The hammer of what? The hammer of sin. That's what sin does in every one of our lives. You take a hammer, bam, that's us now. That's the effects of this sinful, broken world. We are broken we are broken. The pieces are lying on the ground, okay? But then I call, that's what sin does. But then I always follow up with what? God comes along. He takes all the broken pieces of our lives, right? He picks them up, broken by this world and by our own sinful actions, and then he cleanses us, right? He takes every one of those pieces, scrubs it clean, and he begins to put all the broken pieces of our lives back together again, setting us free from all of sin's bondages, removing all the residual effects of that brokenness in our lives over time, okay? It's a, it's a process, and he heals our soul, making us whole in him, and then we are set apart once again for his purpose. In fact, there is a wonderful um, form of art. I think it comes from Japan. I forget the name of it, where they will literally take a cup and they will smash it, but they will reform it, and guess what they use to reform it? Gold. They will put all the pieces back together, and the substance that holds all those pieces back together is gold, and that, my friends, is a perfect picture of what God is doing in all of our lives as we allow him, okay? He takes the broken pieces of our lives, cleans us up, and then he puts us back together again, okay? But this is a process it's, and a journey, isn't it? How many of us know it is a journey? It takes time, and this is why we call ourselves what? journey church because we are all on a journey in this process of learning to walk with Jesus Christ through this life learning to become citizens of his kingdom learning to be the ambassadors he wants us to be learning to live this life he wants us to live so that we can be made whole in him okay this is a process and and so then may I just go into one more thing here that I use as a picture many times of our journey We're walking down the road, our pathway in life, right? All of us are doing this at one time before Jesus. We're walking down this path. We're headed this direction. Who is coming the opposite direction? It's Jesus. He's coming the opposite direction. Where's he headed? He's headed home. And he passes us at some moment in our lives. And he calls our name. And if we're listening, right? If we humble our hearts and listen and yield ourselves to him, what does he invite us to do? Follow him. So then we have a decision to make. Am I going to continue on in my own path, which is leading me where? To my destruction. Okay? It is leading me to my destruction and ultimately taking me to hell. 
okay? It is the pathway to hell. But Jesus comes along. He whispers our name through the power of his spirit. And if we're listening, we re begin to realize, oh my goodness, Lord, the way I'm going is wrong. And so we have a change of heart that leads to a change of what? Yes. Change of direction. Amen. Guess what I just explained to you? Repentance. Yes. Because that's all repentance is. It is a 180 degree turn. Oh. We have a change of mind in our beliefs that leads to a change of heart and then a change of direction. Mm -hmm. And we turn from the direction that we were going on our own and we begin walking with Jesus in this new path. And we're learning to walk with him, aren't we? And as we learn to walk with him, he begins to heal us and cleanse us from all the bruises that we got because in this path, we happen to get off the path quite often into the weeds where we got cut up and tore up by this world. And he begins to heal us. He begins to speak into our lives truth that sets us free from those things and he leads us home, okay? That's a picture of redemption or of repentance and of sanctification. In fact, in his letter to the Thessalonian church, Paul concluded with this. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless, okay, whole, pure at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the one who calls you, Jesus Christ, is faithful. And he will do this. Hear that, my friends. He will do this. He will accomplish it. Now, it won't be completed in this world, but guess what? When we stand before that throne of grace in heaven, we are going to be made completely whole in him, aren't we? Yes. And we're going to be able to hear those words, welcome home, yes. good and faithful servant. <clears throat> what a wonderful time that's going to be. Okay? And we all individually have a role to play in this, and we as an entire church body are working at this too. So what does this look like, our role as a church? How are we putting this into action? And I'm going to wrap it up with this point here this morning. Well, first of all, if we are going to have a positive impact on people's lives whom we interact with so that we can share the gospel with them, so that we can make a difference in their lives and point them to Jesus. They just might have that encounter with Jesus as yes. he passes them by in a conversation with us. Wouldn't that be exciting yes. for some of our family members and friends whom we care so much about? That's what God wants to do, okay? But to be able to do this in a way that will help people hear God's call to them and move closer to him, then we need to be people who welcome and embrace other people. We need to welcome and embrace other people. Can I say this? This includes everyone moving to our valley. <laughs> now, if you are new to our valley, may I be one of the first, if you haven't been welcomed so far, welcome to our beautiful valley. Join us here in what we're doing, okay? Um, <clears throat> but we, we, we pray to be a refuge. I've been praying this. God's been answering. Lord, make us a refuge, a place of refuge for people scared, fearful, just looking for something different, looking for a place to come, and they can find rest, find security, find hope in their lives. God, bring them to us. Guess what God is doing? He's bringing them. I know some of you may want me to quit praying that prayer. <laughs> I've started thinking, okay, Lord, keep bringing them. Not quite as many, though, all at once. But anyway, no, keep bringing, Lord. Let us be people who welcome and embrace others. This should happen naturally and spontaneously in our lives individually because it's part of who we are, and for the most part, it does. God works through our relationships, our friendships, but we always have to keep working at this. We always do. When we first, in fact, for us as a church, when we first launched as a church, and we didn't have much history except maybe a few months behind us, it was easy to say this. If you've been with us for three months here, you're an old timer, okay? You're part of this church, so you need to look for the new people and welcome them. Because if you'd been with us for three months, that was a long track record when we were first getting started. So I, we were always telling people, look for the new ones and welcome them, okay? 
Now, it's kind of hard to say that anymore, but guess what? The same philosophy exists, okay? If you have been here for more than three months, guess what? You need to quit waiting for other people to come up to you and introduce themselves to you. You're part of us, okay? You need to reach out to others in order to get to know them, but also to see how they are doing and then try to encourage them, okay? We cannot come and just sit in our seats and go, well, I wonder who's going to say hi to me today. Uh-oh, uh-oh. Can I, do I dare take this any further, Jimmy? Go do it, okay. He's, he's egging me on, okay? He's, he's egging me on, you heard it. Pastor Randy here sitting Sunday morning. I'm wondering if anybody could come say hi to me. You don't see that happening, why? You always think, why? Well, that's the pastor's job, right? That's his job to say hi to everybody. Well, guess what the point is I'm making with this? I'm a minister, right? Who else is a minister in this body? There you go. We all need to raise our hands, don't we? You might not never see me sitting here going, boy, nobody ever says hi to me. I feel so sorry for myself. Nobody here likes me. Because I'm out saying hi to everybody, it's my job. Well, guess what? Can I transfer that to all? It's all of our job, isn't it? We are ministers. Now, we might show up here some Sunday going, oh my goodness, I just can't do it today. I'm just hurting too badly. Okay, I need somebody to come up. I really need ministry. God, would you send somebody my way? That happens. I understand that one, okay? We need that from time to time. I'm hoping as we are growing in Christ and walking with him, those days become less. Now, granted, you might be going through a spiritual battle, some attack on you. The enemy has launched against you. So you might go through a season like that when you are growing in the Lord. But I trust that in those seasons, you don't just pull back and wait for others. You go to somebody and say, can I need some help. Can you pray with me? I need a friend at my side. And I hope then you will feel comfortable to do that in this body, knowing you have friends here, you have brothers and sisters in the faith, okay? I hope I didn't step on too many people's toes there. Okay, anyway. Hey, Jimmy egged me on, okay? (laughs) I'll blame it on him, okay? (laughs) Sorry, Jimmy. You're awesome. We need to be reaching out to others in in order to be able to encourage each other. Now, we also have several ministries that are in place to help us welcome and embrace others. (coughs) Excuse me. We have greeters at the door and in the entryway. Thank you, greeters. I'm so thankful for you guys. You guys are setting the stage for people to come and worship God. Do you realize that when we were starting was to us the most important ministry? Because... That set the tone for somebody coming, seeking God. If they are welcomed with a warm smile and a handshake, hey, how you doing? Nice to have you here. Guess what it does? It begins the process allowing the Holy Spirit to work in their lives. It really does. It's so important. We have our ushers who are ready to assist people. Our grounds crew make sure the church property is looking good and is safe. And can I say, nice job, Tony. He went and mowed the whole place yesterday. It looks awesome. And our security team operates to make sure everyone stays safe because a safe environment is inviting and comforting. Uh And all of this is meant to help people focus on God so they don't have to worry about their own security. Everyone feels welcomed and our hearts can be helped to meet with God. And I thank Steve for heading up our security team. (laughs) Mr. (laughs) If you... If you don't know this about Steve, when he was in law enforcement at the height of his career down in Southern California, um, (laughs) no, I have cousins who just visited me who are from California. So anyway, Steve was the head of his SWAT team. Isn't that that kind of cool? He was the head of his county SWAT team, which basically meant this. He was the first one through the door. The first one to get shot at, yeah. So anyway, (laughs) I guess that's a badge of honor. So anyway, and we're also working on a connection team that will help guests when they come through the door get connected with uh, people in our congregation who might have similar interests or work, things like that as they 
engage people in conversation. And all of this, what I just described, falls under the leadership of Rick Helms. So Rick, yeah. it is so nice to have you being willing to take on all that responsibility. But we want to welcome and embrace people. That is the first step in welcoming people to create that environment Amen. for them in our worship services as they're going this direction. Amen. And Jesus passes them by so that they're willing to listen mm -hmm. and hear his voice. And maybe all these people seem pretty cool. Yeah. They're pretty friendly. I like what I see. I feel welcomed here. I might turn around and join them in following their Jesus. Yeah. See? Okay, so the first step, welcome and embrace people. Now, our outreaches also fall into this area because of what we're trying to accomplish there, but each, our outreaches kind of stand on their own. We're not going to make Rick responsible for all of them. Aren't you glad you didn't have to do the children's carnival? Lead that one. I want to say thank you so much again to Aaron and everybody who helped out with that. That was awesome. But then, when somebody gives their lives to the Lord, surrenders to his authority, we need to help people grow in wholeness and find healing in their lives. So we need to help heal and restore people. That's the second step of this journey that we're on, okay? Again, this needs to be a natural and spontaneous thing that comes from all of us because I'll tell you this, a word of encouragement and knowing you have a friend can be so helpful in this process. Just knowing we have a friend, somebody who encourages us. And this is also a big reason why I wanted Pastor Russ Michaels to come and speak with us because a prophetic word from God that does what? I'm going to prophesy in a sec. That strengthens, encourages, and comforts someone can be so helpful in this healing and restoring process that God is walking us all through. Plus, we're accepted by our church family, knowing we have a place to belong with people who are real friends is something we all need. It's part of God's plan for our lives, and that's a role we, the church, are supposed to play both for each of us and then us towards each other, okay? And so in this area, we also have ministries in place to help us uh, carry these out. Other ministries that we'd love to develop as well. We have our, and I think I'm getting the name correct here. Oh, Diane's in the nursery, okay? Travis, blessings in action, right? Yeah. That Diane Hall heads up that gets meals to families in need, whether that they've just lost a loved one, okay? They're grieving or they're experiencing a particular need. I am so thankful for that, for that. When somebody's at a point of brokenness, we can be there to help yeah. out, okay? She's always looking for people who like to cook for others, too, okay? So if you like to cook, talk to Diane, okay? We also have our food pantry that Gail Reeves with Jack's, Jack Carabin's help heads up, and they're always on the lookout for people who are in need of help with food. Thank you so much, Gail, for taking that on. And who else? And Lisa Tate helps out a lot there, too. Yeah, she cracks the whip on you guys, doesn't she? Yeah, I know. He does it with me. So anyway, no. We also just started a new ministry, our COVID care ministry that Mike and Brenda McKnight are, are helping us with and helping us develop. And if we find out that someone, now some of you who went through COVID and wrestled with it before we had this, you're going to be like really jealous and say, man, I wish you guys would have had that when I was sick. But whenever we find out somebody is sick, I let Mike and Brenda know and they will call to make sure they're taken care of. Hey, do you have any needs? Is there some way we can help you out? And then if they do have a need, they'll call us who are not sick to get things done. Amen. Plus, we also have care packages then that can be delivered to people's doorsteps. <clears throat> and that's so much fun being able to deliver those care packages. Yeah. And I'm hearing they actually mean something. Yeah. So I have not actually had to battle COVID, but I'm hearing from those of you who got them that they were special. And in the future, there are several other ministries that we'd love to develop, one of them being Celebrate Recovery, which if you're not familiar with Celebrate Recovery, it's an overtly Christian form of Alcoholics Anonymous, okay? We also have other counseling ministries and opportunities as well, all of which this whole area being developed under the leadership and with the help of one gentleman in our church body who I don't know if I need to mention him this morning. He, he might 
he might, no, no, <laughs> Jimmy Martinez. <laughs> <clears throat> Which, if I can also say this about Jimmy, if you guys don't know, Jimmy is 34 years now? 35. 35. Holy cow, you're getting old, buddy. <laughs> you're looking good, though. You don't show it, okay? Um, 35 years as a Montana state licensed addiction counselor, and he has worked his whole career in boys' homes in the Valley and done a phenomenal job. He's got all the resources there. Okay, and on top of that, he's, ordained, he's an ordained minister with the Pentecostal Church of God. So, nice to have you here, Jimmy, and have you on board helping us, okay? <clears throat> and we've been talking, we would love to develop some ministries that help our children's ministry, youth ministry, uh, young adults, all of us, uh, marriages and things like this, when people are in need to provide that safety net and have some counseling available. And finally, to help us all grow. So, so far we have, and I'm almost done here, I promise you. We want to welcome and embrace people, right? Yes. As this as safety net. We want to help heal and restore people. Then we also, now that we're growing in maturity, we want to teach and equip people. Amen. And guess who we just hired to be our associate pastor to help us in this area? Do you see the method to my madness where we are heading, Okay. Now, we already have a few connection groups in place that are aimed at this. Steve and Lisa Tate lead one. Rick and Nancy Helm lead another connection group. Trina Miller leads a Bible study, okay? Joan Melrose has a Bible study, um, actually training ministry, that she used to teach at her Bible college in Kenya, Africa, that, that, or that sent ministers out into the field, that is available as well. And we'd love to, to develop other connection groups, okay? But besides being able to help with the preaching load on Sunday mornings, Pastor Lynn is also going to be helping us with our leadership development and equipping all of us for ministry, okay? Now, he won't be able to dedicate his entire time to this since we're also helping them develop this ministry of their own called Dust of Emmaus, okay? But we've been talking about several things, and I am just really excited about some of the things that we are going to be getting going here in the future. So, in all of this, can you see where some of our focus is as a church? Do you see where we're heading? This is a process of sanctification. It is a journey we're all on. And we need to let down the net, as Jesus said, and grab yes. as many people as we can, bring them with them so they can have an encounter with Jesus Christ. And in the process, they can find their healing in him. And we can be part of that, okay? God is putting the broken pieces of our lives back together. And he wants us as his church body to be part of that, okay? So if you've ever wondered what I'm thinking about for our church and the sum of the direction I'd like to go, this is the core of it. I feel like we have a very, very special and important and unique role to play in this valley that no other church has. Okay? We have a calling from God. Amen. Now, this doesn't set us apart as better than anybody else, okay? but we're not worse off than anybody else. We are part of Christ's church, <clears throat> part of what he is doing in this valley. Right. But we're an important part of that, aren't we? We're an important part. We might receive people that other churches may not be ready for, okay? They might not fit in at another church, but they'll fit here. They might not fit with us. Guess what? That's fine. There's all kinds of wonderful churches in this valley, okay? And when we get our mortgage paid off, can you see how some of the doors could open to help us move forward even more in what God has called us to do? There's even more we could do. So this is not about us building our kingdom, not about us building our church. This is about his kingdom, right? It's about his church. We're part of his church. I'm so thankful we're part of that church, and we're going to play an important part, okay? It's his will, not our will. And it's for his honor. Just like Jesus commanded us to pray, Father, your name be honored in all of this. All that we're doing as individuals, as families, and as a church body, God, we want to bring honor to you so that your kingdom can be built and your will done. And guess what happens? 
God moves the whole thing forward. Isn't that wonderful to be part of? That is awesome, isn't it? So, well, will you stand with me as we close in prayer?